today, part two in our series with regard to the invitations of Jesus. And today we're talking about how he invited us to follow him. Now, all of us know what it is to follow something, right? Who here follows a football team? Who here follows a sports team, any sports team, right? And by the way, you won't see me lifting chairs today because Everton play at 12.30 against Manchester United. So I'll be on my way, okay? And plus, they took, they took, I'm not joking. <laughs> they took 10 points from us for absolutely nothing. So I need to, I need to go home and watch this game. So this is when we follow. <laughs> Beg pardon? Well, here's the thing. When, when we follow these, these teams, right? When you talk about the team, do you say them? What do you say? Us. Like, we follow these football teams, and these, we, we get so involved in it that we say us like we run around the field with them, right? And when something bad happens to your football team, like, none, none, of, no one, none of you have experienced what's happened to mine. No other team has had 10 points taken away. When something like that happens to your football team, it affects you, doesn't it? My, nobody in my house could speak to me for two days after they took those 10 points from us, right? So we know what it is to follow. But Jesus gives us an invitation to follow. The first week we looked at the overarching one. So we looked at who we should follow, the person. Today we're looking at why we should follow. Tomorrow we're looking at, um, next week we're looking at how we should follow, what it looks like. And then finally, um, the last week we're looking at the results of following. So, Last week, here's what we looked at, real quickly, the overarching invitation. Who can tell me what it was? <sighs> Don't go in your phone and bring up your notes. <laughs> Who can tell me what it was? The overarching, and he selected the disciples so that they might <laughs> be with him. Mark chapter 3, Jesus went on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. And we saw that before he sent them out, before he did anything, even after he sent them out, the primary thing that Jesus wanted was for them to be with him because every other invitation that he gives can only be uh, carried out if we are with him. Okay? And then we said, we talked about, remember this? The, the invitation is a transformative intimacy with Jesus. It's not just, you know, um, a closeness. It is being so close that your relationship with him transforms who you are. And I, I want to say this about, about us, about, about me, right? Oftentimes when I'm convicted by the Lord... And oftentimes when I'm convicted by anything, like when you get convicted to lose weight, when you get convicted to anything, one of our biggest problems is we overestimate what we can do in a week. But we underestimate what we can do in a year with consistency. And so the Lord convicts you and you go home and you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Same thing if, you, if you, know, you get convicted to get healthy or lose weight. You go, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And then after a week, you're like, I can't take this anymore. It's why we make New Year's resolutions and they don't make it to February. <laughs> because we go at them so crazily, right? So with all of these things that we're talking about, if the Lord convicts you, what you need to do is to put into place some things that are sustainable and that you can do consistently, Right? Because if you do them consistently over a year, you'll be shocked at what God accomplishes. And don't do what I do, which is overestimate what you can do in a week and put in so many things in place that you'll be exhausted. Okay? So next week, we're looking at you're invited to remove everything that hinders you. And these are, this is the verse we're going to use. Jesus, the rich young ruler, Matthew 19. Jesus answered, if you want 
to be perfect. Go sell all of your possessions, give them to the poor, and then after you do that, come and follow me. And it says that he was sad and he walked away. And we're going to look at this and say, it's not about riches. It's about the things that stop you from following. And then finally, we're going to look at his invitation to the abundant life. And our verses are going to be John 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. But for today, Jesus' invitation to follow him. Okay? Things we need to know about following Jesus. These are just a list of some things that we need to know about following Jesus. Okay? First thing, it's primarily about who you will become, not about what you can get. Now, this, this, this one is really, really important. Because one thing you have to understand, every single one of us enter the Christian life as a consumer. That is, Jesus has something that we need and want, salvation, and we enter saying, Jesus, you have something I need, and therefore, I'm entering this relationship with you. But what has to happen is, we move from being a consumer, that is, what can I get, to being a real follower, that is, what can I become and what can I give? That is the point of following, okay? Now, and our verse says this, Matthew chapter 4, as Jesus was walking beside the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Jesus says, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. So Jesus approaches them and, and says, come and follow me. And it says, immediately, they dropped their nests on and followed him. So, the reason he asked them to come and follow was because he said, I am going to, in some translations it says, make you fishers of men. I am going to take you from where you are now and then make you to somebody that's useful for the kingdom. One of the ways that you can, you can understand whether or not you are following Jesus correctly is to check your prayer life. If your prayer life is Jesus give me and not Jesus make me, now I'm not saying we shouldn't play Jesus give me, but if all you pray is Jesus give me and never play Jesus make me, something is wrong with the way you're following. It means that your focus is what can he give me rather than what can he make me. And this is an important thing, I'm serious, to examine your prayer life and see what, what, what in the world do I pray for? What, what do I pray for? Am I, do I pray for all of those things that I lack? And it's nothing wrong with that. But often what we do is we do it to the exclusion of praying anything about what I want to become for him. Do you realize if we are following, primarily our prayer life will be, God, use me. God, make me into something uh, greater than I am today for the kingdom. God, please do this in my life so that I can do this for you. That's what our prayer lives will look like. But I don't know about you. My prayer life often looks like, you know, there, there are things going on in my life, and, and there are things that I want to see change, and I typically am focused on those things. Now, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for those things, but if we are very rarely praying about who we are and who we can become in Christ... It means that that's not a primary concern of ours. Can I tell you truthfully? Following Jesus means that you are never content where you are with him in Christ. Now, here's what I mean. The Bible speaks about going from glory to glory. Following Jesus means that we are consistently looking for the next level of glory. We are not resting in the level that we have right now. So the primary evidence of whether or not you are following is who you are becoming. It ain't what you have. I hear people all the time saying, this one guy said God's going to give him a, uh, it was a very expensive car that was very popular in Bermuda back in the day, so that people will know that he's his child. And I'm like, well, why don't God make you into somebody 
who people see and know that you're his child. Because the problem, if, if we measure whether or not we're following by what we have, we have an issue, you know. You know what the issue is? Yes. The issue is most Muslim nations have more than we have. So if, if, if we measure it by what we have, we would have to go and say, well, listen. And the other problem we have is how do you go to impoverished nations and say, you know what? If you're following Jesus, you would have this. We would have a gospel that could only be preached to the wealthy. That makes no sense at all. The gospel of Jesus Christ comes to change primarily who we are. And when we get to abundant living, we'll be talking about the results of that and, and, and debunking some myths about what abundant living is. Now, in order to illustrate this, I, I want to show you an interaction that the disciples had with Jesus. Right? But before we do that, let's read this. If we think Christianity primarily consists of us getting something from Jesus rather than us surrendering ourselves to him, we see Jesus as someone who we heir to our lives rather than someone we surrender our lives to. Here's the interaction with the disciples. This is, this is such a fascinating interaction. Mark chapter 8, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? So now Jesus is saying, who do you think I am? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, always Peter, right? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, watch what happens next. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days will rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter, again, took him aside and began to rebuke him. This blows my mind. You're seeing him walk on water. You're seeing him feed all of these people. And you take him aside to rebuke him. But you know why Peter rebuked him? Because Peter said, the Messiah I'm following, none of what you just told us, that, that, that does not look like what I have determined that the Messiah should be. And I don't want that Messiah. I want to follow a Messiah that's going to take us to victory right now. I don't want, you're going to die? That makes no sense. And Peter, because he had determined what it looked like for him to follow the Messiah, took the Messiah aside and rebuked him. He just earlier said, you are the Messiah. And now he's telling him, you're not the Messiah. If, that, if all of this is going to happen, you ain't the Messiah I thought you were. And he takes Jesus, just the fact that he took him aside. Like when you take somebody aside, you know what that means, right? Like if I'm taking you aside, if I say, Herman, come here, I, I'm, you know what's about to happen, right? But look, look at Jesus' reaction. Look how serious this is to Jesus. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. Do you understand what Jesus is saying here? Jesus is saying that if you desire human concerns over the will of God, then at that, the time when you desire that, you're being led by Satan. Then he said this, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And if we are coming to Jesus for just what we can get, you know what? We have in mind human concerns. Merely human concerns and not the concerns of God. Listen, do you realize that sometimes God doesn't give you what you need or what you think it is you need or want because you aren't what you need to be right now to receive it? And if you got it, it would destroy you? Do you know how many people have gotten money and it destroyed them? 
Because they weren't where they should be in order to receive it and then deal with it rightly. There are people who have gotten millions and millions of dollars and years later had nothing and were strung out on drugs. God wants to give you stuff, but he wants to make you into a person who can receive the stuff that he gives you first. Because if he gives it to you without you being that person, you probably you might not even use it for his glory. You might even think you don't need him anymore. Because we have primarily human concerns. That is, we are praying, God, give me, and very rarely, God, make me. And even still, rare, even less rarely, God, use me. Now, again, watch how important this is to Jesus. He was talking to Peter, right? But he was talking to Peter... And then he cleared it up with his disciples. And then look what he does next. Then he called the crowd to him. This is so important that he didn't just speak to Peter. He then went and spoke to the other disciples. Then he brought the whole crowd and said, along with his, with his disciples. So all of everybody's there now and said, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Man, he don't just talk to the guy who said it. He talks to everybody else. This is so important. I need to make this clear to everybody. Now, in, in, in John chapter 6, like this type of teaching causes everybody to leave, right? So Jesus says to him, you all are following me because of the miracles that I performed, right? And he says, your stomachs are full now. You all ate and everybody, and you're all following me because of things that I've done for you. And then he goes on to tell him what it really looks like to follow him. And then you know what it says? Many people left. Because those people were following for what they could get. And when he cleared it up, it says they left. Then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you guys going to leave too? And then you know what Peter says? It's always Peter, but Peter's something else. I should change my name to Peter. <laughs> Peter says... <laughs> This is what Peter says, seriously. Peter says, where are we going to go? And then he says, this is cool, though. He says, because you have the words of life. Right? So following Jesus is not primarily about what we can get from him. It's about what he can make us. Secondly, who you decide to follow is critical. It will determine the direction of your life. Now, listen. Just because you've accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior doesn't mean daily you decide to follow him. Just because you accepted him as personal Savior, it doesn't mean that daily you decide to follow him. Do you realize that daily we have to make a decision to follow? Daily. Right? And what we can do is, all of us have, have like leaned towards certain characteristics of Jesus we like. And, and churches oftentimes take up these characteristics. Like, you might have a church that only talks about his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness. Right? And then you go to a church around the corner, and all they talk about is his holiness and his justice and his judgment. But the Jesus we follow is all of those things. You can't just select a portion of him that you enjoy and quote all of the verses around them and none of the verses around the other one. Jesus is... Merciful, gracious, but he, how, how can you be loving if you are not just? You can't, right? So, here's what happens. Here's what happens in the book of Acts. Now, remember, these are all people who have heard the gospel and accepted it. Now, Paul writes to them and says, I'm sorry, not the book of Acts, this is First Corinthians. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. And then he says this. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's saying, you guys have accepted Jesus the gospel, but now you're deciding to follow people. That doesn't make any sense. Thirdly, 
You do not determine what it looks like to follow. He does. One of the things that we can do, uh, which is detrimental to our following, is we can determine what it looks like. Okay? I mean, if I had like a little checklist that told me that I was following, it would be easy. Right? If I had a checklist, Jesus said, listen, every Sunday, every Tuesday, you're in church. Okay? At least a minimum of one ministry. Right? Three times a year, you tell somebody about Jesus. Right? At the end of the year, I could go through that whole checklist and go, wow, look at that. I'm following. And look at that. This is wonderful. But do you know I could do every single one of those things and have nothing change in here? There are people who, I mean, it, it's, it's very easy to follow a list of laws. It is much harder to allow God to change you to who he needs you to be. Next one. Oh, sorry. Here's our verse. Jesus answered. And this is, we've already read this. This is the rich young ruler. So he says that you need to deny yourself. And we'll talk about this in detail next week. But basically what he was saying um, to him is, you know, you don't get to decide what it looks like to follow me. Right? Because he was saying, you know, I kept all those laws. So he's like, I must be following. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Here's what it's going to look like for you to follow me. Even when you don't take following Christ seriously, those watching us take our following Christ seriously. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been on your job, and this happened to me when I used to work at Belka. Have you ever been on your job, lost your mind, and Donald said something that wasn't befitting of what it meant to be a follower of Christ? Anybody? Let me see this. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> well, a couple of honest people, right? So you lose your mind on your job, and you say something that you know you shouldn't have said. You do something that you shouldn't have done, and you know what has always happened to me? Somebody who saw it said, and you're supposed to be a Christian. Do you know what that person just said? I watch you. So even if you don't take it seriously, they do. But you know what else that person said? I watch you, I know you're a Christian, and so I have a standard for you. Because if you weren't a Christian and did the same thing, they wouldn't have said anything. So they even have a standard for you. And sometimes it can be an unrealistic standard, right? A standard that says you will never fail is unrealistic, right? But they watch. So if you go in and decide, well, today I ain't following at all, I'm going... The people watching you do not stop. My daughter sees me. And my prayer is that what she sees will be this. Paul says again in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, follow my example as I follow the example. Of Christ. Uh, this is something I've used several times here, but this is a picture of a father of a son. And the father says, the father says to his son, be careful where you walk. And the son says to the father, you be careful where you walk because I walk in your footsteps. Now, this one's important. All of us has something that keeps us from following Jesus. Do you realize that? Every single one of us has something in us that keeps us from following Jesus. The way he desires us to follow. Knowing what those things are is key for our freedom to follow. Oftentimes, we don't like things pointed out. Right? I mean, if you have children and you point out something to your children, how many of your, your children celebrate when you point it out? Right? Your mother, your father comes to you and says, boy, well, that's how my mom always started. And I knew what was happening after she said boy. Whenever she said boy, I kept my distance. All right? But 
she would point out something. And you never celebrate it. But it's almost like when God points out to you something that is stopping you from following the way he wants you to, you should celebrate that you know. Because now that you know, you can, with his help, do something about it. If you ignore it, if you decide, that's not me, that means that thing will always stop you from following. Now, for me, that thing has always been pride. I told you this story a long time ago. Mark Hall, who was mentoring me, looked at me and said, God wants to use you, but man, you're prideful. And there was so much pride in my response to that. Honestly, I let that man have it. That's the first time I've ever talked to Mark in that time. Hey, who do you think you are? We always begin with that. He's talking about me, and then I say to him, who you think you are, right? Now, Mark pointed this out because he wanted to see God use me, right? And then you, you know what happened to me when I first started doing this? It was a struggle. It was a struggle. Because often I wanted to be up here to impress you, but not to give you something. But I did wanted to give you something that you could use, you know, for your walk. But the primary reason I wanted to be up here was to impress you. To impress everybody that was listening. And it was a struggle for a while. It was a struggle. God, I want to be able to, you to use me. Uh, but I'm struggling with this thing where, you know, the reason I want to stand up for him because I want him to all say how wonderful I am. Can I say one of the things I love about this church is that I don't have to act. Like I can say something like that and nobody's going to go, oh, my word. You know what I mean? Like if I was in a church where I had to be a pastor and I could never speak about what I struggle with, like it would be exhausting. Right? So Mark told me. Why did Mark tell me? What was he gaining from it? He was risking a friendship, but he loved me too much not to tell me. And God loves us too much not to tell us because he, when we get to the abundant um, life part, he wants us to have that. And he says, this is keeping you from following me. So if I don't tell you, would that be love? Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to disciples, whoever comes must deny themselves. And again, we're going to really get into this next week. The purpose of following. Here's why we follow. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. One of the reasons we follow is so that our former way of life would remain in our former way of life. But you stop following your former way of life will quickly become your present way of life. To put off your old self, that's one of the reasons we follow, right? Which is being corrupted by his deceitful desires. And here's why we follow. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. Change how you think. And this is an ongoing thing. This is why you have to consistently follow. And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Here's the reason why we follow. Let's say, like when, before I started lifting weights and eating too much food, I was really, really skinny. Right? That's my former self. If I showed you a picture, you wouldn't believe it. My hair looked too big, but my body are so tiny. It's true. I know you're having a hard time seeing that now, but it was true. But what the Bible is basically saying is, if I had a jacket that fit me back then, right? When I follow, I should get to a point where I try to put on that jacket and I just can't get it on. Like, it don't fit no more. And if, if, I, get, if I even get it half on, it makes me so uncomfortable that I have to take it off. I can't even wear anything anymore. Because my new self just can't take it. It don't fit who I am anymore. Because I've been made new in the attitude of mind. This is why we follow. Look what Philippians chapter 2 says. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindsets of Jesus Christ. One of the reasons we follow is so that when we relate to each other, we have a different mindset than we had before. Which means, I understand 
something about who I am in Christ, who you are in Christ. And so if you come to me to tell me something that I don't, you know, really want to hear, I, I have a completely different mindset in how I receive it. We deal with each other differently, right? We follow in order that we might know what Jesus knows, see what Jesus sees, and feel what Jesus feels so we can do what Jesus would do, react how Jesus would react, and ultimately allow Jesus to live his life out through us. That's why we follow. That is why we follow. Now, the importance of fishing for people as evidence of following. So when Jesus saw him, he said, follow me and I will cause you to fish for people. We just said we need to know what Jesus knows, see what Jesus sees, so that he can live out his life through me. Out of everything that I do, the thing that I need that for mostly is when I decide to tell somebody else about Jesus. Do you realize that when you go and tell somebody about Jesus, you, you, you basically have to empty yourself of yourself? Because I don't know about you, but usually, this is a, this is, this is a crazy thing. I'm a pastor, but usually when, when God has placed it in my heart to go tell somebody about him, as I'm going there, self brings up every excuse not to do it. Every excuse to say silent. Well, suppose they say this. Well, suppose they do that. Well, what if they don't like me anymore? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Fishing for people, to me, has to be part of our lives as evidence of fully following. If there, I think, this is, this is, my, my, this is what I think. If there is zero fishing for people, how can we say we know what Jesus knows, see what Jesus sees, and we have his heart? You think if Jesus was on the earth, he wouldn't tell anybody? So if we are living out the life of Jesus and never, ever, ever saying anything about him to anybody who needs to know him, how can we say we know what Jesus knows, we see what Jesus sees, and we have Jesus' heart? Fishing for people is, is something that needs to be a part of our lives as evidence of, of fully following. And what we've done is we basically say, you know, um, you know again, we, we say, well, I do this, I do this, I do that, and I do that. And all of those things are wonderful. And we might even, we might even subconsciously say this, so I don't need to do that. But in my mind, if we are full following Christ the way he wants us to follow, fishing for people will be a part of what we do. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 4 says this, But you, keep your head in all situations, to do hard hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and discharge all the duties of your ministry. Now, just some encouragement with regard to fishing, okay? First thing, you only need to know what you know. Everybody thinks, I don't know this, I don't know that, therefore, I can't say anything to anybody. Here's what Jesus asks. In Acts chapter 1, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive Power when the Holy Spirit comes on, look, look, power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. What is the first example of the Holy Spirit power? What's the very first thing it says? Witnesses. Now, I'll tell you something. It doesn't say you will be my theologians. And it doesn't say you will be my apologists. Right? And we think we need to be theologians and apologists. What does a witness do? A witness tells what they have seen and known. If you have come into contact with Jesus and you have seen and known him, that's all you need to know. Now, you may not be able to answer all of their questions, but that's okay. Tell them, I don't know. But here's what I do know. 
But here is what I do know, right? We think about God, you know, everything. Again, that verse makes it clear. It says, you'll get power, and you hear the Spirit comes, and then it says, and you will be my witnesses. Now, witnessing comes in many different forms. It doesn't mean, you know, you have to stand on the streets with a bullhorn and all of that stuff, right? Nothing wrong with that. But it comes in many forms. Witnessing is sometimes just getting to know somebody, spending some time around them, sharing your life with them, talking about the difference that Jesus has made for you, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Those of you who, who follow a football team, ever had any problem talking about them? I have never in my life had a problem talking about Everton, even when they were struggling. To, they almost got relegated. When they were doing terrible. Well, they still kind of are now, but, but that's because they took 10 points from us. <laughs> but I never have a problem talking about them. You know why? I love that team. It's true. I have cried watching that team. <sighs> Hopefully that won't be today. But anyway, <laughs> then why do we have such a problem talking about Jesus? Here's, here's some serious encouragement for you. Jesus says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Okay, look. Sometimes you think, you know, if I go tell somebody about Jesus, they may attack me. Well, you ever put a sheep in the midst of wolves? What happens? Jesus is telling you before you go out, some people may attack you. But he tells you it's not you, it's because they hate me, right? Then he says, be on your guard. You will be handed, well, this part is, I hope it's not, you know, it's not um, part of our experience today. This is back then. You'll be handed over to the, look, look what he's telling his disciples when he, has, when he tells them to go out. You'll be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. This is how I know, um, there's so many reasons why I know uh, this book is real. Because if you wanted to make, a lot of things that, that are put in the Bible, if you wanted to make something popular, you wouldn't have put in there. Like, I wouldn't have put that Peter denied him, or Peter, I would have just shared all the stuff he did in Acts. I wouldn't have put. If I was telling the story of David, I'd have told Goliath, not Bathsheba, right? <laughs> On my account, and if you wanted disciples to do this, would you have said to them, look, you're going to be flogged. <laughs> <laughs> On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and, gen and, and to the Gentiles. But when you are, when, listen to this, but when they arrest you, you, don't, you do not worry about what to say. Or even how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking. But the spirit of your father speaking through you. So you know what? Oftentimes, we don't experience that. You know why? Because we don't put ourselves in a position for him to do it. Like, you know, so, uh, you get prompted. I, I need to tell this person about it. We don't go. Do you realize sometimes if you would go... Stuff would come out of your mouth, and you'd be like, where'd that come from? And then your faith would increase. Okay, you don't have to know all the answers. Check this out. Matthew 21, this is Jesus. Jesus, I love his interactions with people. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders, uh, uh, elders of the people came to him. But by what authority are you doing these things? I asked him a question, right? And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I'll also ask you a question. Now, they asked him a question, right? And he says, I'm going to ask you a question. If you answer me, I'll tell you by what authority I'm going to do these. I do these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from human origins? They discussed it among themselves. I could see the huddle. <laughs> this is so funny. They're in a little huddle. They discussed it among themselves, and they said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origins, we are afraid 
of the people, for they were all heard that John's baptism was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm going to do these things. Let me ask you a question. Did he answer the question? Do you realize Jesus didn't always answer the question? Because oftentimes when people ask, and ask you questions when you tell them about Jesus, they don't want to know the answer. They're trying to trip you up. And the worst thing you can do is give an answer when you don't know it. Try and give an answer that you don't know. You don't have to give them the answers to all their questions. What you have to give them is Jesus. And if they really are seeking an answer, say, I don't know, but I can go and fi- I'll go and find out. Right? So this fishing thing, we make it so more than it needs to be. Right? But when you're fishing, you just need to know what you know. And then you need to know, for fishing to be effective, you need to know something about the people that you want to know Jesus, right? Like a fisherman. A fisherman has so much knowledge of, now, I know nothing about fishermen. I spoke to a fisherman, okay? A fisherman, this is what he told me. He said when he goes fishing, he knows the depths at which fish typically swim. So fishing for wahoo, he knows that the wahoo swim at this depth, and so he lets his whatever his line down to that depth. What he's saying is he knows something about the patterns of the people of the fish that he's trying to get, that he's trying to catch. We need to know something about the depths of which we need to go in order to reach people. We need to do what he does. He chums the water. He makes, gets the fish prepared. We need to chum the water by living our lives and making them hungry for Jesus. Fishing also takes time. You know, I, I would prefer that we, we could do it like we used to do. You bring somebody, all these people to a revival, somebody stands up there and then people come forward. That ain't happening no more. The world has changed. Fishing is done more one-on-one than it is in groups now. But this fishing thing is so important because every time you do it, it demonstrates you know what Jesus knows. You, have the, you, you feel what Jesus feels and you have the heart of God for people. So we need to follow. We're going to pray now, every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to, before I pray, I want to pray for you. If you're like me and you feel like you have been following Jesus, but almost from a distance, and that you could follow much closer, just raise your hand so I can pray for you. Just raise your hand quickly so I can pray for you. finally, if you are here and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, so you have not begun your journey of following Him, and today you want to say, Jesus, I understand that I am a sinner and that you died on a cross and I, t- and you took my sin upon your body, and today I want to say, that I accept what you have done on my behalf and I want to begin following you. No one's looking around. If anybody wants to do that today, just raise your hand so I can pray for you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, Lord. And the awesome thing about you is that unlike us, you don't point out things to shame us. Sometimes when we point out things to people, God, is almost to make us feel better about ourselves. But God, every time you point out something, you are doing it because you want us to be in a closer relationship with you. So God, today I pray that all of us who name the name of Jesus 
would daily make a decision to follow you closely. God, every day we make so many decisions. And every day, often in my life, every day, the very last thing I think about is have I followed you closely today? God, I pray that you would make that a primary thing for all of us who know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, God bless you, and this week, follow closely to a God who says, if you draw near to me, I will always draw near to you. God bless you.